Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to uh, continue this, the third of four Lee's Knowles lectures on the subject of the civilianization of war. Uh, I want like to uh, approach this subject building on the material presented in the previous lectures. Uh, and on the, in the first lecture and second, I explored two catastrophes that speak to the overall argument of these lectures, that as war changes, so does peace, and that the nature of peace reflects the character and degeneration of war. Civilians become part of the peace treaty as much as they become part of the waging of war. The first of the disasters uh, I tried to describe in my first lecture was the enshrining in the peace treaty in international law of the principle of compulsory population exchange, which was accepted by all the parties uh, and set a precedent uh, that I think was disastrous. The second lecture dealt with a disaster I think no less important. It was drawn from the history of uh, the Turkish revolution, creating the republic in place of the Ottoman Empire based upon the divorce of self-determination from democracy and from the protection of minorities. These were explicit elements of the peace treaty, if you will, the baptism, if one can use that phrase for what became a Muslim republic and then a secular republic, of the Kemalist, Kemalist regime uh, took place at Lausanne during the peace treaty. Now, Without the protection of law, non-Muslim minorities in Turkey were persecuted and eliminated from public life. In this lecture, I want to talk about the same story, the civilianization of war, but in another context. And next week, I invite you to my fourth lecture, which will be a discussion of, I think, the final disaster of the peace treaty uh, which was the occlusion and burial of the Armenian National Project. So there are four instances layered in which we can understand the catastrophic nature of the Peace of Lausanne of 1923. And next year, when there will be those celebrating its centenary, I urge you to remember that the price of peace was the burial of justice. Now today, my focus is on what the Greeks still call the Asia Minor Catastrophe. That's the phrase they use for the defeat in the war between Greece and Turkey in 1922. I examine the subject in three parts. The first is the exposure of the civilianization of war in publicly reported and documented mass atrocities committed by Greek soldiers against Muslim villagers in 1921. The man who did the reporting was none other than later to be the great historian Arnold J. Toynbee. The second part of my remarks today is about the genesis of the Greek catastrophe. I, one might subtitle the second part of this lecture, How to Lose a War in Three Easy Lessons. The way the Greek uh, governments and uh, indeed all of their advisors conducted military operations was uh, indeed catastrophic. And I'll try to show you that we can choose between the words uh, incompetence uh, and blindness. I'll leave that choice to you. The third part is a discussion of what happened immediately at the end of the peace treaty. The disaster of Lausanne carried on after the signing of the peace treaty. Immediately after, and I mean immediately after, the Italian Navy was called back to Toronto and they, uh, Taranto, and they made their, uh, their way forward in short order to the occupation of Corfu. Now that occupation, of course, it was accompanied by the bombardment of civilian sections of the, the island. But what it did was to challenge the League of Nations uh, to uh, act in response uh, to an outrageous um, uh, series of accusations against the uh, defunct, or let's put it this way, uh, uh, profoundly damaged Greek government. And instead of giving the League of Nations the opportunity to keep the peace as everyone had asked them to do, what Mussolini did 
at the end of the Treaty of Lausanne is to show that the League of Nations was simply impotent, that it had absolutely no power to maintain the peace. So the third of the catastrophes that I'm talking about is one that, that I think we need to remember. 15 years before Munich, the League of Nations uh, was the walking dead. As far as I can see, there, and I have done some considerable work in, in Geneva, um, the League of Nations became an agency uh, of what I would call uh, social justice, but in the same kind of distinction that uh, Hannah Arendt made between the political and the social. In keeping the peace, the League of Nations was simply uh, a dead letter already in 1923. And it happened in part because of and in part immediately after the signing of the peace treaty. You know, this is why I call the peace of Lausanne the peace that passeth all understanding. Now let me turn to the first part. And the first part concerns the gentleman on the right, who of course became uh, much better known uh, in Chatham House and in many other capacities as a world historian. Uh, the civilianization of war happens all over uh, the world. In the years after 1918, journalists, historians, and photojournalists, which I think is an important point, brought home to millions of readers the harsh realities of the civilianization of war. It became the stuff that you would read on a daily basis in the Manchester Guardian. Who was the Manchester Guardian's um, journalist on the spot in Greece in 1921? The man on the right, one of the truth tellers of the civilianization of war was Arnold J. Toynbee. Now just to bring you, as it were, his, his uh, cachet, his social cachet, his uh, academic uh, uh, brilliance, I think is very well known. He, he was a Balliol man. He was named after his uncle, a fellow of Balliol with a deep Christian conscience. He's the man, the uncle, who invented the term industrial revolution or popularized it might be the right way to put it. The, his brother's son of, of the first Arnold Toynbee, Arnold Joseph Toynbee, was born in 1889, six years after his illustrious uncle's premature death. Now, the younger Toynbee at Balliol won all the prizes that one could win. Uh, and in 1912, he too became a fellow of Balliol. His field was ancient history, and his love were, was, were the Greeks. He was a Hellenophile uh, of the highest order. After the outbreak of war, he joined the Foreign Office and was part of the British delegation at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919. He was a free trade pacifist in the tradition of Cobden and Bright, not a man of the left, uh, but he was drawn to the idea of self-determination, a supporter of Wilson. His wartime work brought him face to face with the civilianization of war, and I've already talked a bit about this. He was assigned to assist Lord Bryce in the preparation of an official paper on what we now call the Armenian Genocide. He had no doubt where responsibility for the crime lay. It was with the triumvirate that ran Turkey. The damning evidence of the genesis and outcome of the crime was overwhelming. And that's the conclusion he and Bryce published in 1916, a year after the, the beginning of the murders, not their end. Three years later, Toynbee's academic excellence and the forthright position on Turkish crimes committed against the Armenian people drew his name to the attention of the electors of the new chair in Greek civilization or Greek history at King's College London. It was endowed through the generosity of a group of Greek politicians and prosperous London businessmen of Greek origin. Toynbee was the perfect candidate, not only because of his brilliance, but also because of his social cachet. His wife, Rosalind Murray, a considerable novelist in her own right, was the daughter of classical scholar Gilbert Murray, Regius Professor of Greek at Oxford, in 1921, on the nomination of Jan Christian Smuts, the Australian-born Murray, who served as a South African delegate to the League of Nations. Rosalind Murray was the granddaughter of the ninth Earl of Carlisle, uh, raised at Castle Howard, and as I said, had a distinguished literary career. Now, Toynbee was, uh, as it were, the only candidate, well, no, there was a second candidate, but the only candidate who had a chance to be elected. He was interviewed and offered the post on the 24th of March, 1919. In other words, uh, in the middle of the peace conference. The senator of the university confirmed the election in late May 1919, before the peace was signed. Two weeks earlier, Ronald Burroughs, the principal of King's College and a close friend of Greek Prime Minister Venizelos, wrote to Toynbee about his teaching plans, added how delighted he was to learn that day of the Greek landing in Smyrna, because they would bring Greek civilization to the barbaric Turks. 
Toynbee responded that he too supported the Greek occupation of Smyrna, but wondered whether the only way to sustain the Greek position was to partition Anatolia in half, give the Greeks the west and give the Armenians the east. That was his, as it were, position which was entirely consistent with Lloyd George's pro-Hellenic line. Toynbee took up his position as Correa's professor of modern Greek and Byzantine history, language, and literature in the autumn of 1919. The term of the chair was five years renewable. At the outset, nobody could see trouble ahead, but there was a lot of trouble ahead. In part, this was due to Burroughs' error, an error, by the way, repeated by a number of universities, including my own. Yale has made this terrible mistake. The mistake was to grant the donors an advisory role in the management of the chair. It's a terrible thing to do. I'm sure the University of Cambridge would never do anything of the kind. Now, I think the source of the trouble was in, lay in the Greek occupation of Anatolia uh, itself. It was untenable from the start. And violence against Muslims was part of that Greek occupation. It was an intrinsic part of the occupation. It wasn't an accident. In the summer of 1920, Toynbee applied for leave to enable him to spend some time in Greece. And he arrived there just after the return of King Constantine and the fall of Venizelos. I'll come back to that division later. He visited Smyrna, Ephesus, Pergamon, took a particular interest in how, Greeks, uh, how Greece was handling the problem of governing a mixed population. But he was entirely in the corner of the allies and, uh, and the Greek government, even the one led by Constantine. He was also there as a secretary of a committee on mandates in Turkey. The idea was probably, it's, it's not at all clear uh, that they had a, a plan, but the idea was to give the, the mandate for Turkey to the United States. The problem was it was a non-starter. It couldn't possibly have, have, uh, uh, have been realized. But so many plans in international affairs start that way anyway. Now, he was a, a secretary on mandates and therefore there to make sure that the protection of the rights of minorities, which is one of the fundamental elements of the peace treaty in the establishment of the League of Nations, uh, was uh, respected. And therefore, he had full access through the Red Cross and the Red Crescent, the Muslim Red Crescent, to the southern sector of the Sea of Marmara and the Yalova, Yalova Gemlik Peninsula. Now, that's on the, on the left is the committee on which he said he's the second man, the young second man from the left, if you can see just partly his profile. Now, where he went, let's see if I can do this now. Where he went was there. If you see up on the, on the north, this is a, a, a heavily populated area just south, due south of Constantinople. And it's a peninsula where uh, by boat you could arrive in the peninsula in about three hours. It's, it's effectively in the middle of the Bosphorus, the Sea of Marmara, and the enormous tr flow of traffic uh, that um, uh, was uh, being carried out in the occupation of Turkey after the end of the war in 1918. Now, the, the problem was that as soon as he came to get firsthand knowledge of areas to be detached from Turkish control in order to make the Greek presence in uh, in this area um, uh, permanent, he saw what he couldn't deny. He saw undeniable evidence of Greek army organized atrocities against Muslim populations. Now, the point is that what, what I wanted to do, I, I thought about showing you the cable itself. In the Toynbee papers in, in the Bodleian and, and Oxford, they have all of his cables he sent to the Manchester Guardian. He was their man in Turkey. And all I could do, though, was to uh, make it uh, readable this way. This is the uh, cable that um, Toynbee himself sent. Let's see. The precise date is the 28th of June, 1921. Having received reports Monday evening, Greek atrocities, Ismid, spent night before last and yesterday preparing ship and passing Allied control, stop. Last night, fearing Greek warships, we anchored off Prinkipo, stop. This morning, caught red Greek army, red-handed, burning Turkish villages on retreat from Izmid, westward, towards Yalova, along south coast, Izmid, full stop. This is this classic uh, Manchester Guardian reportage. Steaming up 
gulf opposite direction, saw smoke ahead, first of two villages, then others nearer, started burning in rapid succession, stop. Coasting a few hundred yards offshore under protection, Allied Commission inquiry, which preceded us, Ismid, in British destroyer last night, we suddenly saw flames bursting out in village Washi, and then there's a word that's illegible, Greek column and village stop. Retreating Greek army has been burning every Turkish village and town it has reached all through today, stop. These all regular troops in uniform, infantry, cavalry, baggage train, retreating in formation without pursuit, stop. Burning not done by Chetis, brigands, nor during fighting, stop. And then it, it carries on. Troops were retiring leisurely and burning in cold blood, villages and even boats moored offshore, read, and then there's a word read, I have no idea what that means, covered by Greek flotilla battleship, two destroyers, transport, and Red Cross steamer passing burning villages. Stop. Konya burnt two months ago. Now, here is, if you will, the road to Damascus. What Toynbee saw was the exact opposite of what he believed. And it was his decision to immediately send the cable uh, to the Manchester Guardian, which publication utterly undermined the position of Lloyd George and the British government in supporting the Greek side in the Greek-Turkish war. Now, the reason he did that was because of the overwhelming evidence that you'll be able to see, oh, sorry. You'll be able to see, let's see if I can read that there. Um, you'll be able to see quite easily uh, the kind of photography that was captured and kept by the Red Crescent of the kinds of uh, atrocities that took place. You know, the children's images, I don't have to, I think, repeat these too much. There's so many of them. Well, uh, you see the decapitated man on the right. The, uh, the question uh, of, uh, of decorum and good taste actually was a discussion in the Manchester <coughs> Guardian in 1921 of how many of these could they put there. But the more important point was Toynbee's name. Toynbee's name behind these utterly undermined the British government's position uh, on uh, the uh, future uh, of, uh, of Turkey. And it was a very important moment in the end of Arnold Toynbee's uh, position as Correa's professor in London. You can imagine what the donors thought when they picked up the Manchester Guardian on the 29th uh, of uh, June 1921. Uh, this was the beginning of the end. And in fact, four years later, uh, strangely enough, he, his, he was not renewed as professor uh, in the University of London. Now, it went further than that. The next day, Toynbee saw the graves of Turkish villagers recently shot. Their arms had been tied behind them. How many times have we read that in the last few weeks about what goes on in Ukraine? Uh, the civilianization of war, I, I, when I wrote these lectures, I had no idea uh, how close to the present reality was the record. One way to put this is that uh, Putin has a very uh, dark past, uh, uh, which he is extending. Uh, into an even darker future, and I shall try to make some remarks next week about how that might affect uh, the concept of peace after the war in Ukraine. Toynbee saw the destruction of the principal mosque in the town. He saw torn up Korans and the remains of a pig slaughtered in the mosque as a final desecration. The Turkish troops he saw in the area, though, in contrast, the Turkish troops he saw there were disciplined, and the local Greek Orthodox Church was untouched. The contrast, this is his, his words, the contrast with Greek army was overwhelming, he concluded. And I think he, the important point was that at the moment, the great spokesman for, let's put it this way, uh, um, a Greekophile liberal humanist, the, this exposure of the underside of the Greek cause uh, is very similar to many later examples of journalism exposing the civilianization of war. It's not just in the Milai incident. There are many instances that we can talk about in the Second World War and, of course, uh, in, uh, in uh, the, uh, the Middle East, uh, 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 other parts of the Middle East as well. What happened was, in 1921, the Greek army had uh, basically come off, mm, not better or worse, but uh, it was a standoff between the Greek army and the Turkish army at two battles in a village called Inono. I'll try to show you that a little bit later. And, and when the army was, as it were, uh, not beaten, but not victorious, was the moment when they turned on the civilians. 
The civilianization of war is a strategy of either a defeated army or of an army that fears defeat. And by fear of defeat, produced the atrocities that brought that defeat closer uh, to reality. What they left behind was the wreckage of a reign of terror. The surviving population of the towns that Toynbee visited had fled into the mountains. They were there were refugees everywhere in the devastated countryside uh, which he saw. And the question uh, that uh, Toynbee put is how could a country support a war effort uh, which was ex becoming more and more unpopular, partly because of um, lassitude. You know, war for four years is bad enough. War for seven years, eight years, it's simply too much for people to su sustain. The reason for continuing war had to be justified, not the reason for pulling out of it. Here was a man, I think, who supported the British government until he saw the truth. And the truth was that supporting the Greek government, which is what Lloyd George did until the bitter end, uh, was supporting uh, those who had uh, engaged in barbarous atrocities against civilians, innocent civilians. Here was the author of the authoritative denunciation of the Armenian genocide writing about a Greek plan to exterminate Muslims. That's the phrase he used. It was extermination. It wasn't a punishment. It wasn't a response to a particular act of resistance. It was extermination. These Muslim villagers were not combatants. They were raped, brutalized, and killed because they were civilians. And their suffering was the response of an army that was beginning to taste defeat. It wasn't the end, it's just the beginning. It's the first time they, they failed to break the back of the resistance uh, to the Western occupation, the Greek occupation of, uh, of Turkey. There would be more. I'll come to that a little bit later. Now, atrocities committed against civilians on both sides of the Greek-Turkish War uh, are, un, uh, are so well documented that it is impossible to deny them. I recently gave a talk on this subject in, in Athens. There are people who still deny them. Um, in fact, uh, the, what shall I call it, the, the wound inflicted on the Greek polity uh, by the defeat, the Asia Minor catastrophe, is still uh, unhealed. It's, it's still an open wound. Uh, it's a question that I could return to later on uh, to talk about. Uh, I think as we saw last week, when a war of self-determination excludes from the self, meaning the nation, ordinary people of a different religion, then these civilians excluded become what we now call a fifth column, an asset to our enemies and therefore a threat to the emerging nation itself. That kind of thinking led to the internment of enemy aliens on both sides of the Great War all over the world. And it also prepared the ground not only for the Armenian genocide, but for Turkish atrocities against Christian inhabitants of Turkey in the years 1919 to 22. I also would like to speculate that this material very carefully examined by the early Nazi party and their supporters, uh, you know, uh, uh, there are, uh, long letters by Carl Schmitt about how here's, here is the moment when politics is exposed as the appearance of the enemy. The enemy is irreducibly the enemy. And these, these are villages we're talking about. The civilianization of war is something that I think he theorized and the Nazis realized because what did they do? They, these, these Greeks uh, villagers were hostages uh, for a Greek victory. And when the Greek army didn't, didn't secure that victory, they were the ones who paid the price. To a degree, one way to understand, uh, if you will, if the word is true, the logic of the Second World War is that the Jews of Europe were hostages against the entry of the United States into the Second World War. And when Hitler felt, after the Atlantic uh, Charter of 1941, uh, that the United States had already entered the war, it was time for the final solution. I believe that civilianization of war that everyone understands has a precedent, a, and a clear precedent, that one can find in the way in which the peace of Lausanne uh, was framed. All right, one thing that produces um, the civilianization of war is a defeated army. And the question is, in the second part of my lecture, how did the Greek army get to the point where it was completely destroyed? And I think there are, are ways of dealing with it. And it'll take me a little time to, uh, to talk about this. So I thought, what I thought of doing is to show you uh, and the uh, same kind of visual evidence of the civilianization of war on the Turkish side. I'm not at all making the claim 
uh, that the Greek army was unique. On the contrary, my argument is that after 1918, the civilianization of war was part of the waging of war. It became normalized. And it became normalized in a way that I think still exists today. I, I don't, for a moment, uh, understand the, the uh, full logic of Putin, but I believe he believes it's a normal part of war. After all, he did it in Chechnya. He did it in, uh, in uh, he is doing it in Syria. This is something we perhaps haven't uh, paid enough attention to, uh, and the same is happening in, in Ukraine. Now, what I want to do, is, this of course is the biggest uh, disaster of the all in Smyrna, about which I talked. This is an interesting point. The civilianization of war is related uh, by um, Robert Gerhardt and other scholars uh, to the um, militarization of political conflict. Now, one reason why the Greek army was destroyed in 1922 is because uh, the Greek nation was fractured. It had no unity in the political world. Uh, the enemy uh, was uh, subject to violence. So here's a, uh, an example of a uh, prime minister, uh, Venizelos, a Western, Western oriented modernizer, a liberal, 19th century liberal, who did believe in the Greek idea of Megali extending an empire from one side of the Aegean Sea in Europe to the other side of Asia. He didn't believe that. He was the arch enemy of the king, Constantine, who replaced him at the end of 1920. But before that, two outraged. Uh, Army officers uh, shot him just barely missing. Uh, he was wounded, but not seriously, in the Gare de Lyon. Notice this Greek propaganda for Venezuelos. You see the angels on the top. This, this, is, this is the war of the sons of light against the sons of darkness. And the division between the two sides got so severe that when one side came, and you know, there was a referendum, should the king come back or not, and the Greek Population voted for King Constantine, then as he was resigned, and then what did Constantine do? He fired all of the uh, army officers that Venizelos had appointed. Whatever their confidence, the political, as it were, savagery of the, the domestic war, uh, utterly undermined. This, again, this reminds me of what Stalin did with Tukhachevsky and, and others in, 19, in the 1930s. There, there is a notion of a war being constant uh, Whichever side is in power is the one that gets the Now, here's my summary, because I realized uh, while teaching this university for many years that teaching economic history is very difficult in the visual age. Because there's too many graphs and tables. So, I, what I decided to is to not show you any, but to do a sketch, an explanation of why it is that the uh, Greek army lost the war. And the primary answer, answer is political divisions. I've already uh, dealt with that. But it is as well. I, I don't think I can put it uh, too strongly for you. It is economic madness not to plan an expedition of 300,000 men operating between five and 800 kilometers away from their base of supply. It is madness. Uh, as I said, is it incompetence? Is it blindness? What is it? Uh, it is whatever it is, it is the way to lose a war. There was no planning whatsoever for the occupation of Smyrna and the extension of Greek army activities between 1920 and 1922. The point being, as I said last time, the Treaty of Severn, which was supposed to settle the final treaty of the Great War, broke up Anatolia into, I would call them fiefdoms, or separate sectors of imperial power. And the Turkish part of it was very small. The Turkish army was fighting for its land and saw Greek invaders the way in which many others uh, have seen invaders on their soil before. Now, what were the Greeks fighting for? They were fighting to protect their civilians, meaning Greek Orthodox villagers, who had been brutalized before. That's the motivation. The motivation is to protect your own kind, and your own kind were Christian. So there was, a, as it were, a harsh edge to the, shall we say, culture conflict in, the, uh, in, in this particular case. What happens, of course, is when you have no planning, someone has to pay the bills. And that's why I, I thought you'd enjoy this quote from the um, hit, uh, official history of the Greek army. <coughs> when the Greek headquarters arrived in Smyrna in May 1919, this is right at the beginning, the army was in a problematic position due to the shortage of financial resources. Hooray. Various formations had failed to pay army officers and soldiers from December 1918 to January 1919. 
The army wasn't paid. My old friend Jeffrey Parker showed that in the 16th century in the Army of Flanders. You want an army to go berserk or, or to go home? You want it to fail to, to follow orders? Don't pay it. That'll, that'll work <laughs> particularly well. The railway companies were threatening with termination of transportation of various sorts, actually in these munitions, due to the state's inability to pay the railway fares. Thus, various suppliers terminated the deliveries of various goods. The situation is quite critical due to the shortage of financial resources. It's, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a central quote in the beginning of the story of what went wrong in the Greek war effort. Now, what went wrong in the Greek offer, uh, war effort was everything. Rapid inflation. Inflation, and that it was inevitable in that in the course of, uh, of the war, uh, and Greece only entered the First World War in 1917, uh, the uh, shortage of, of goods inevitably pushed prices up. But what I think is extraordinary is to realize at what point, you know, we, we know a great deal about German inflation in this period, and it is much more than that. But Greek inflation in 1922 was 600 percent over 1941. Uh, just to show you, the, the price rise between 1914 and 1918 in France and Britain was about 100 percent. In other words, doubling the prices. Multiply that by six, and you have an idea of what inflation meant. But it didn't stop there, because effectively this was a game of poker, in which the Greek government said, we are doing the work of the Allies. We're going to defeat the Turkish resistance, and we're going to force the Turks to sign and ratify the Treaty of Seven. In other words, divide Turkey into small uh, 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 sections. Uh, we, therefore, need your support. Well, Lord Curzon was not impressed, and he said, well, we will support you, but only if you have a plan, only if you work towards a particular set of objectives that we can support. Uh, and Constantine uh, was one of those who uh, simply didn't believe that the British government could actually betray a friend. You know, the conservative parties working against, uh, along, along the, uh, shall we say, backdrop of betrayal. But in, in this particular case, it, it was betrayal in the, in, the, in the British government's case of Lloyd George, the master of betrayal himself. So the, the fundamental issue was that if the Greek government is going to dare the British government not to pay them, not to provide money for arms and ammunitions, they're walking on a plank without any support whatsoever. The best example of this is, is I think, something that I've only come across on one other occasion. It's this. It's called the dichotomy. The dichotomy of the Greek currency is an incredible story. Can you imagine this? You know, maybe, maybe we can imagine this. It's possible. The idea was that the only way for the Greek government to pay uh, the transport and uh, acquisition of munitions was by saying to everyone in the country, you know the five pound note you have? Half of it now belongs to the government. It's basically a 50% devaluation. Well, it says, what you do is, you, the first uh, governor of the Bank of Greece is on the left, Savos, and on the right is the crown. So the right-hand part of every drachma bill belongs to the state today. The left hand, you can keep all by yourself. So what happens? An incredible spending spree. You can imagine what people would do. The price of shoes went up by 60% overnight. You would get objects and you would buy necessities rather than to keep these things because who knows what the state is going to do tomorrow. They're going to take the left-hand side of the, of, the, of the building. Now, this dichotomization of the Greek economy is one of the classic instances of, uh, of economic planning that goes absolutely nowhere. Because by the time they uh, uh, realized that the British government wasn't going to, realize, wasn't going to pay them uh, already agreed loans, the value of the drachma had dropped by 80%. Now, in that case, we can now add another player in this story, which is the markets, about which we've heard so much over the last weeks. The markets, especially the London bond, international bond market, sold not a single Greek bond in 1922. It was worthless. It was worthless to do so. So what is a Greek army going to do if it simply doesn't have enough financial support? What the, uh, the king decided to do is the charge of the light brigade. Into the valley of death rode 300,000 Greek soldiers, and they went further and further inland so that their lines of supply were easily interrupted, and, and indeed, the, uh, the, the food, water, and munitions that they had uh, were adequate possibly for a battle of three days. 
On the fourth day, this is on the 26th to the 29th of August 1922, the Greek army cracked. It literally just cracked open. And four different columns fled in four different directions. And this, this disaster preci uh, precipitated the second major wave of atrocities against Greek villagers. Because once the Turkish army uh, realized what was happening, that the Greek army was killing Muslims in the villages, Turkish soldiers did the same. In flight, the Greek army was joined by over 300,000. Think about this. There, uh, pro the, 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 the estimates are between 50 and 80,000 Greek soldiers were out of killer wounded. So there are 220,000 fleeing west. And they're joined by another 200,000 uh, villagers who either have seen their, their, uh, their villages burned down or know what's going to happen if they don't. Now this wave of outward movement produced atrocities uh, undoubtedly in the same horrible magnitude um, by the Turkish, the victorious Turkish army uh, in revenge as the Greek atrocities that were there before. Now, what, what I feel is important is to realize how this links up to the third part of my story today. The third part of my story today uh, deals with Mussolini. Now this, by the way, is a, is a um, cartoon uh, done by two Hungarian gentlemen who made a business out of caricaturing the great leaders of the Treaty of Lozana. Uh, their names are Darso and Kevin. They're very interesting. They, they believe that they extended the tradition of uh, political cartooning to the international diplomatic era, <coughs> in which there was very little uh, beforehand. And a lot of the, uh, they, and they sold, by the way, they sold hundreds of these books of, of caricatures, especially uh, to the Egyptian market. Uh, some of them many years ago told me that there's a very special sense of humor in Cairo. Maybe that's the reason why it works so well there. But these, these people went on and uh, had um, a great success in creating shall we say, exaggerated images. That's in Mussolini on the right there in his, uh, shall we say, uh, fawning uh, diplomatic uh, representative at the Treaty of, of Lausanne, uh, Count uh, Barone. Barone uh, they stripped away some of the elegance, perhaps, of, of diplomatic exchange. Now, why am I showing you this, man? Because the third of the disasters uh, of Greece uh, followed the defeat. The Greek army was destroyed. There was only one army in the field in September 1922. It was the Turkish army. Now, in any diplomatic setting, that meant that the Turkish delegation to the peace conference had all the cards in its hands. The Greek delegation could only observe sauf qui peut. They could get whatever they could out of the embers of their I would say, disastrously planned and disastrously carried out policy of invading uh, Anatolia. So what happens at the end? Yes, the, Turk, the Turkish delegation dictates almost all of the major, <coughs> uh, uh, major parts of the peace treaty. But the gentleman on the right is watching. He couldn't care about Lausanne. Lausanne was a photo opportunity for him. In fact, the only time that he really enjoyed himself was at the beginning when uh, he had been uh, a uh, socialist anarchist trade union uh, rabble rouser in, uh, in Switzerland, escaping from Italy to Switzerland. He had been arrested by Italian police and thrown in jail as, as a, a, a vagrant uh, in his early days. So what he wanted was to force the, you know, the, uh, uh, the Prime Minister Poincaré of France and Lord Curzon himself to come to him rather than he would go to them. And he did so by saying he couldn't really get to, uh, um, to um, uh, Lausanne before stopping at the village of Teretek. It's, it's basically a, a suburb of Montreux. It's a little village. Uh, and so he, he sat there and waited until all the journalists in the world were, were around, took a photo out with the, uh, with the three great men and became, the, two weeks after he was appointed prime minister, became a great diplomatic figure. He did nothing in the course of the Treaty of Lausanne, but he ruined the end. And that's the last story that I want to tell you. The last story of the Treaty of Lausanne is uh, just as bad as the, the first two. And I think for, for reasons that we could, you know, we could perhaps um, link to later um, events in the 1930s and 40s.
I want to put to you this proposition. I want to define peace as a condition in which a state of violence between belligerents comes to an end. Doesn't that sound inoffensive? I hope so, because it's not true about Lausanne. On the same day that the treaty was signed, on the 24th of July, 1923, Mussolini ordered the Italian fleet to return to Toronto, and the next week, discussion took place about what kind of military action they would take against Greece. Italy and Greece had been, of course, at loggerheads for decades over Mediterranean power. On the 27th of August, 1923, Mussolini found his smoking gun, quite literally. A Greek-Italian military convoy set out by road on Greek territory to delimit and map the border between Albania and Greece. The Greek soldier's car broke down, or so they said. The Italian cars carried on. There's the conspiracy, right? The Greeks were not going forward, only the Italians. And that, those Italian cars, three of them, were ambushed by gunmen near the Kakavia border crossing, now in Albania, at Santa Quaranta on the road to Janina, which is now in Greece. It was basically, they were, they were mapping the border between Greece and Albania. The leader of the Joint Commission, General Tellini, the Italian General Tellini, and two other Italian soldiers and their interpreter were killed. These men were carrying out a mission under the authority, not of the League of Nations, but of the Conference of Ambassadors, a group of diplomats charged by the Allied Supreme Council was seeing that the terms of the treaties signed after the war were carried out. This is, I think, a critical point. These people were working for sovereign states, not for the League of Nations. And the, con the quarrel, or the, if you will, the clash between the authority of the League of Nations and the authority of sovereign states is what Mussolini exposed and used for his own purposes. The conference dis dispatched a commission to investigate the circumstances of this crime, which it termed, quote, odious and without precedent. The Greek, army, uh, the Greek uh, government offered its deep apologies, but this was certainly not enough for Mussolini, who was furious. Having returned to his post in Athens, the ambassador of Italy to Greece had a stormy meeting with the Greek foreign minister and insisted that the Italian government participate in the police investigation of what had happened. Now, they did it deliberately because that is exactly the language that was used by the Austro-Hungarian government in 1914 against <coughs> Serbia. In other words, you frame a, an ultimatum that you know will be refused, that you know is unacceptable, that the sovereignty of the state carrying out the investigation uh, would be rendered uh, null and void uh, by this matter. Now, I think the, uh, what, what is, is really uh, quite extraordinary is what happened. What happened is that the Greek foreign minister, Nicholas Politis, and the Greek delegate to the League of Nations went to Geneva to ask the, the League of Nations to intervene so that war would not break out. And the fundamental I think betrayal of the League of Nations that took place in those three or four days uh, established uh, the first moment, I believe, that we can legitimately use the word appeasement. Appeasement was born there and then because even uh, a League of Nations supporter like Lord Robert Cecil, a liberal of, uh, well, he's conservative, but part of the coalition government uh, of 1919 to 1922 was prepared to uh, provide Italy with what they wanted as long as they would withdraw their, uh, their fleet from the island of Corfu. While these negotiations are going on, uh, Mussolini's navy shelled the island of Corfu. There were 16 civilians who were, who were killed, uh, and the island was occupied. So effectively, it was a fait accompli. The League of Nations made a decision then, it seems to me, that was uh, quite uh, disastrous for the long-term future of the institution. And it was made by and large, because the British and the French government simply had no interest whatsoever in giving the League of Nations an authority to, un, if you will, to defuse a, a war crisis. How else, or how better, to expose the weakness of the League of Nations when confronting an ultimatum issued by a stronger state against a weaker one? Don't forget the Greek state had basically collapsed. It not only collapsed, 
but parts of the army that were pro-Venezuelos engaged in a coup and got rid of the, uh, the king's men, in, 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 including, by the way, the father of, uh, of Prince Philip. Prince Philip was born in a small, uh, I think it, well, the story is that he was, he was uh, just in a, in a little wooden crate um, and spirited out of the, uh, of the Middle East because his father was in danger of being shot along with the other six men who had been responsible for the defeat. The British pressure, uh, I think, gave the, uh, the life of uh, Prince Philip a turn uh, that we, uh, we should be thankful for. Now, I think the, the notion that, that when Mussolini decided that using armed force was a much better way of uh, conducting international affairs than uh, engaging in, in diplomacy like Lausanne, we're seeing the beginning of the emergence of a new moment in interwar politics. It's a moment where those who have the nerve, uh, the arm, and the taste for violence can engage in attacks on civilian populations without the slightest doubt as to the likelihood of their success. What Mussolini did in 1922 and 23 uh, was to start his new foreign policy. It's a foreign policy that broke radically uh, with uh, the, shall we say, very sophisticated operation of uh, Count Sforza, who's an Italian foreign minister before, but he, he saw Mussolini, through Mussolini uh, within a few, a few days of Mussolini's arrival. Now, the conclusion I want to, uh, to draw from this uh, story is uh, the following. Appeasement is a very uh, effective strategy uh, when the great powers refuse to compromise their sovereignty in the interest of collective security. The League of Nations was dedicated to changing the balance, not at all undermining uh, sovereignty, but changing the balance between collective security and sovereignty. Mussolini put an end to that. From 1923 on, the League of Nations did very important work in disaster relief. One of those disasters was the flight of Greek Orthodox civilians from Turkey. And through uh, the good offices uh, of uh, the ambassador, the American ambassador to Constantinople before the war, Morgenthau, the London bond market offered uh, a loan to the Greek government of 12 million pounds that provided the capital for the construction of housing and facilities and infrastructure for over a million uh, Greek refugees. When I, when I talk about, the, as it were, the League of Nations is a very successful uh, institution for the uh, assistance to those who are in, in, uh, in danger. I, I, I'm not saying that ironically. What its original purposes were, though, were very far from that. So the, the first point is that what we see in the, in, the, in the story of Greece in 1922 and 23, and in the reaction of Mussolini to the end of that story, uh, is a, another way in which to count the consequences uh, of the Treaty of Lausanne uh, as, uh, as disastrous. Now, what I want to do in the final lecture is to return to the overall theme and to see if I can uh, flesh out a bit more of this interpretation of civilianization of war. It is not uh, a, an interpretation that is familiar, I think, in the literature of the interwar years. Uh, and the more I, I reflect on it, it's uh, an interpretation that has a bearing uh, on our understanding of what has happened in Ukraine and what is going to be the difficulty of constructing peace at the end of that war. If I'm right, and my premise that as war changes, so does peace, we can, see, I think, we all agree that what Putin has done is to challenge us in the same way as Mussolini challenged uh, the League of Nations. Uh, is there more room for appeasement? Is there room for military action? Uh, what is precisely the investment in uh, constructing a peace between uh, a, a, a government and indeed a military that is engaged in the, in the targeting of civilians as the primary act of war? It's not even secondary, it's, it's primary. And what do we have to say about the fact that 
our governments in different parts of the world have done nothing about the same thing in Syria. And it's not just Syria yesterday, it's Syria today. It's, it's, it's still going on. Now that, as we're clear in present danger, uh, to a, a division between war and peace as separate uh, modes of life, uh, I think raises severe clouds, severe difficulties in an understanding of what the future might be. Putin, in my view, if you will allow me a personal view, he must be defeated. He must be. But what will follow, I think, can only be solid, sol solidly based if we recognize how long is the tradition of the civilization of war and how it makes the negotiation of the peace a much more difficult operation than was true before 1914. Thank you very much.